Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Got a great show in store for you. Yeah, this guy, I mean, as one of his bona fides, he qualified and then passed an English setter at the NAVDA Invitational Test. If you are a NAVDA member, you know how hard that is. And it's setter? Wow. Even more so. Good job. Curtis Fry, looking forward to talking with you about that. Gundog training in general, your work as a NAVDA test judge, and all the other fun things we want to talk about in the world of bird dogs, bird hunting, shotgunning, and all of that combined with, hey, some of your own opinions. Your two cents worth this week. What conservation group is doing an excellent job out there? I'll share some of your thoughts. Looking forward to seeing them. So if you're not in on it yet, go to the Wing Shooting USA or the Upland Nation Facebook pages and put in your two cents worth there. And, of course, as always, Wild Birds Public Access Pheasants on the opener in the pheasant state capital of the world. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight into one of my favorite places in South Dakota. So that's what's in store for you today, as well as, well, maybe a little bit of this and a little bit of that, including what you're doing on the training field these days. Looks to me like from uh, what I'm reading and what I'm getting in the way of phone calls, it's about introducing puppies to gunfire and then to birds. Well, actually, it should be the other way around now that I think about it. You know, that's the, that's the first answer I give everybody about gunfire. They better be excited about birds. And um, so good luck if you're on one of those or some of the other puppy things, just going through uh, Gun Dog magazine and looking at all the uh, puppy-oriented questions, including a story I wrote for them on uh, picking your next dog. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, it's in the uh, issue right before the one that's out now, which, by the way, also has a story of mine. Thank you, Callie, for all of the work that you're throwing my way. Appreciate that. Here, speaking of work, Flick, who's dozing in the crate right next to me now, is working on uh, refining his finds. That's the easiest way to describe it. We're uh, trying to make sure that when he hits that scent cone, he does not pass go. He does not collect $200. He just stands still. And we are at the point where live birds are being shot over him. So wish us luck. So far, so good. My goal, of course, steady to wing shot and fall for all the reasons everybody else has the same goal. So good luck if you're working on that as well. The Upland Nation podcast is made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Choke Tubes. Learn more about them at truelockchokes.com. Well, if you met me, there's a good chance you've met me at the Cabela store in Mitchell, South Dakota. I spend the day before and the day of opening of pheasant season at the front of the store with a dog on a table, signed in books, and just talking about all the fun things that happen there. Mitchell is kind of a crossroads. It's the first, well, it's the first place you can stock up for gear once you leave the, uh, the airport at Sioux Falls. So that's why everybody stops. They have a big event, and it's always a lot of fun. But, you know, everybody keeps going from there. And, you know, I decided a couple of years back to explore there instead of going on to somewhere else during the opening weekend and sure enough i found lots of empty space and lots of public access six or eight different patches of walk-in property managed for pheasants just south on highway 37 of mitchell south dakota so if you're ever in that neighborhood and you don't want to keep going maybe for a day or two head south well plan ahead in advance in fact Make sure you wear good high boots or maybe even some rubber boots. There's a lot of water out there some years. That country is full of shelter belts, CRP, some food plots, and some cattails all south of Mitchell, South Dakota on Highway 37. Good luck. Hey, maybe I'll see you there this year. We're brought to you in part 
by Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. If you're looking for a place to entertain folks and you're somewhere in Western Oregon, it's always worth a look. Or if you're passing through, and this time of year, a lot of people are kind of getting their road time in. And uh, so stop on by. It's right off I-5. Lots of group opportunities there, whether it's a bachelor party, client hospitality, um, introducing a group of kids with plenty of supervision. They've got an entire page on their website called Groups. So go to midvalleyclays.com, click on the Groups tab, learn about how they can entertain your party of 10, 20, or 200. Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. That's where I go for my lessons. Maybe you should too. And once I learn how to shoot better, I'll be heading for Huron, South Dakota and the Ringneck Nation. Hunt Huron SD.com is where you get all the information you need to plan your pheasant hunting trip to Huron, South Dakota. They've got the Ringneck Festival, Bird Dog Challenge, 124,000 acres of public access, and they'll help you find the good stuff with a free information packet. So go to Hunt HuronSD.com. Just scroll down and find the request for the free hard copy of all the maps. There's some discount coupons, lots of information. And if you plan your trip right, maybe I'll see you there. We'll be there at the end of October for our Fur Feathers Friends event. Come on down or come later in the season for the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge. Or just come to enjoy all that public access. Well, we shot his dog at the NAVDA invitation. No, I don't mean like that. I mean, we, we took pictures of it, moving pictures of his dog at the NAVDA Invitational. You saw it all on Wing Shooting USA. Curtis Fry, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. It's great to finally talk with you. I know, I know we had a lot of fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun because I wasn't testing a dog. I, I know what you go through to a small degree, having tested at every level but that. But, you know, and, and we had so much fun watching a, a, a setter do all the stuff <laughs> that people don't think a setter can do. Uh, and and then when you passed and, and I took you aside, we did a little on-camera interview, I, I, I couldn't find anybody happier than a setter owner handler winning well winning passing the navda invitational test so number one congratulations again but well, thank you thank you've you. gone you've gone so far beyond all that tell just let's just start at the beginning how'd you get involved in all of this well we'll go back to the setters i guess because that's really the you know the dog of my choice what i've had for the last 40 years um it all started you know i was about 13 years old in a a friend of the family took me pheasant hunting and he had two English setters. And, and at that time, you know, there were wild pheasants still in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. a lot of, um, a lot of you know, dirty farming practices back then and, and uh, not as clean farming as they have now. So a lot of hedgerows and there was good habitat and there were wild pheasants here. And, uh, you know, I went out and I think I shot, you know, a box and a half of shells that day. <laughs> <laughs> never touched a bird <laughs> and had a big smile on my face in the day and my the friend of the family said why do you smile about you didn't hit anything i said yeah but i love those dogs yeah and, and he had two setters that would just point back each other and um the next year he gave me a puppy oh my and that's what started it right there and i've had him ever since you know so um, just grown with the breed and and started field trailing and then hunt tests and then Got into Nabda through a friend um, that I worked with, and really just fell in love with that organization. And it's 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 testing and then judging, and then just you know it kept on going and going, and here I am. You know, I, I I'm smiling, I'm laughing with you about missing uh, a box and a half worth of shots. <laughs> um, but in a lot of ways, I think um, that that's good for a beginner. The last thing I want when I bring a newbie out is that they connect on the first shot because then they think it's easy. Exactly. <laughs> it, it would have been nice to connect on one, maybe. But, <laughs> but, but I still just couldn't get over those dogs just pointing and backing each other and, and holding those birds, you know, and it was just something that I had never witnessed before, and it, it made an effect on me. It had an effect on me, and really kind of you know directed my life from there you know because that you know my life without dogs wouldn't be a life 
So I, I remember uh, hanging out at a uh, at the time a friend's house, uh, and he had recently divorced. We're sitting there in the house, and all the pictures on the wall were of his short hairs. <laughs> and I, I realized why he'd gotten divorced, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like you've gone quite that far. No, my love, my, my, my wife loves the dogs just as much as I do for other reasons. I mean, they're her babies, you know, yeah. but, uh, but she loves them just as much as I do. So it's a good match. Well, you know, uh, can you think back on that moment when you, when, when those dogs in Pennsylvania, um, and we'll lament that the state of hunting in Pennsylvania some other day, but, uh, what what is it because i want to share my version of that with you when i'm done when you're done but tell me what you felt or thought when that all happened as far as like the, the your, uh, your the, first point the first time you saw those dogs work yeah it was it was it was strange because you know we we were out at, I, I grew up you know with hounds and rabbit hunting my dad okay. had eagles yeah. and and we ran, and we kind of, it was more of a leisurely walk in the woods and the dog would kick something up. We'd stand around and, and wait for the rabbit to circle and maybe get a shot here and there. But with, with bird hunting, man, you were covering ground. So you were moving mm-hmm. and, you know, the setters moved pretty good and, you know, you were keeping up with them and then to all of a sudden be, be, you know, running through the field or, or, or cutting through the field at a good pace. And all of a sudden those dogs just stop and slam point and tails up and and it's just you know you see it and you're like man that's just that's crazy i never seen anything like that and um i think that's i don't even know if i shot the first bird to be honest yeah. with you my, yep. my buddy's like walk in there and the bird went up and i'm still looking at that dog standing there on point watching it fly away you know it's like <laughs> oh i gotta shoot you know <laughs> so yeah, that's about how it happened. I didn't even have a gun the first time I went, but I thought, wow, if he'll do that for me, I guess I'll go learn learn to shoot. Yeah, uh, exactly. Oh, um, and and yeah, it, have you ever been tempted to get away from the setters? I mean, every time I'm looking for a wire hair puppy, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it's time to go over to the dark side and get a cocker <laughs> or something. But did, you know, I I love all. I mean, all the breeds, and that's that's what I think. You know really what makes knob the great is because yeah. there's so many different breeds represented in there and you see them all really doing well and so many of those breeds i've seen over the years you know develop through the testing system and through the the registry they've gotten so much better yeah um yeah the breeds have really come a long way so i mean there's so many breeds i would be proud to own um it's just that i always go back to that very first you know run in the field when i was 13 and just can't get that picture out of my head so I'm, I'm pretty much stuck with you know my own personal dogs being being english setters i love it and i i'm the same way if i went uh went to another breed i don't think my current dog would for, ever forgive me <laughs> well tell me about your kennel these days how many dogs you got and where are they in their careers well it's uh it's a it's a smaller number than what we had at the beginning of the year unfortunately both those dogs that you filmed in uh in Ohio there, um, I had to put down this spring. Oh, well, they're old. They were old. <laughs> they were old. They were, they lived a good, long, happy life. Yeah. So no regrets. Yeah. But it still doesn't make it any easier, you know, cause now I'm down to, uh, to two dogs. Um, I have one that's, uh, just pretty much my hunting dog. Now he's gone through all the field trials and, uh, hunt tests and he's got his versatile championship. And then, uh, now I have a younger dog who just qualified this spring with a prize one, so he'll be running next year at Mingo um, in the Invitational there. You know, before we get too deep into this, I don't want anybody to think we're just a bunch of insiders, you know, chuckling and, and nodding and smiling at each other. Nav- <laughs> NAVDA is an acronym for the organization, the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. And uh, Curtis, you, as a judge in that organization, you could probably define better than anybody. What is a versatile hunting dog? You know, a versatile hunting dog is is a dog that's going to hunt on land and water, um, going to retrieve on land and water. And really the purpose of that dog is it's a tool for conservation because, you know, the dog is going to hunt for you before, during, and after the shot. And those birds that we may wound or maybe not make a good hit on, we're relying on that dog to go find it and bring it back. So the versatility of the dog to to not only find the bird, but also handle the bird after the bird shot on land and water is what really makes it versatile. And again, coming back to your your invitational performance, and that's all I can call it, 
Um, perfect example. I re- I'll never forget watching that dog hit the water on that. Uh, I don't know what you guys call it at that level, but it's basically there's about a hundred and 25 150 yard swim across the pond go find a dead duck somewhere on the other side and then bring it all the way back and this is a setter everybody <laughs> you know that that dog absolutely loved the water i mean he, he lived to, to to swim and, and you know and everybody says it's funny because the very first invitation i went to was out in the the red river valley chapter out in, in fargo north dakota and um that's when they had the invitational every other year because there just weren't, you know, that many dogs qualifying at that yeah. time. And, uh, that I had actually had people following me around <laughs> doing that invitational to actually see if the setter would swim. <laughs> I, I, I'm not surprised. It, it's, uh, it's, I'll never forget the first pointer. We, we had a pointer working on a show once who, uh, he, you know, kept getting flummoxed by these stinking pheasants who would run stop run stop pointers doing the same thing pretty soon the last stop is on this peninsula going into a pond and this young (laughs) pointer was so pissed off at that bird when the bird flew and we shot it it was halfway across the pond to get that bird before it realized it was swimming so uh you know it happens and i'm glad to hear it um you know, you mentioned something earlier. Well, let's get let's get over the formalities first. All right. Sure. Okay. Quick. Over and under or side by side? Over and under. Uh, pheasants, woodcock, or rough grouse? Grouse and woodcock. Yeah. Okay. You qualify. We can carry on the rest <laughs> of the conversation. Um, that does narrow it down, though. Uh, where do you get to go? You're in Pennsylvania, kind of yeah. near Pittsburgh, but yep. far enough away to maintain your sanity. Yes. Uh, wh- where do you love to hunt? Well, I have a cabin in North Central PA, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we our grouse numbers have been down over the last several years. We've had a pretty bad stent the West Nile virus. Yeah. That's pretty taking a pretty hard hit on our grouse numbers. Our, our woodcock numbers aren't bad. Um, so we do some hunting there in the North central tier, which is, if, if you know, Pennsylvania, it's like a T basically the two Southern corners, oh, okay. Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, are the, the metropolitan centers, everything else is wooded. So yeah, yeah. North central PA is pretty unpopulated. And it's large tracts of timber. So, we uh we go up there to hunt and i take a week every year at least a week and go to michigan have a lot of friends up there spend a week in michigan and uh, hunt grouse and woodcock up there and uh besides bird numbers what are the differences between your two favorite places well if you look at me one leg's longer than the other that's from walking (laughs) that's that's from walking around the side of the hills in western pennsylvania so uh, you know, Michigan's pretty flat compared to Pennsylvania. So I would say that uh, as far as hunting Michigan, I can I can go a lot more miles in Michigan than I can in PA. <laughs> yeah, you'd do well in the Chucker Hills, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would fit right in. Um, okay, so here's the question everybody wants to ask, and, and you're a nice enough guy. You can you can kind of uh, handle this however you think. But all right, and, and I've had, you know, I've seen incredible dog work. I've I've hunted behind a million NAVDA dogs, and then we were lucky enough to get to the Invitational and showcase all these dogs at the top most level. These are dogs that, um, if they knew uh, where you were going, they could start your car and drive you there. Mm-hmm. Um, high high standards uh, in terms of how finished a dog is the expectations for retrieves for fines all of that obedience all that when you're hunting in michigan or upstate pennsylvania Mm -hmm. do you stick to those standards for uh, say a a dog that is steady to wing shot and fall absolutely yeah you have to because uh you know it, it doesn't make sense to train it all year and to practice it all year and to test it all year and then during hunting season that's that's really why you're testing and training right so you get you get out of what you put in it you know you get that great that great hunting dog and to lessen your expectations during the hunting season you know would be counterintuitive so yeah yeah i make sure my dogs stay steady in our backing um those retrieves everything done um to the level that i would during training and testing and really even training, I train at a much higher level than what I test. So my expectations in training are much higher than, than even the testing requirements. Yeah, I'll never forget at, at that invitation on Nick Rabato, you probably know Nick. He mm-hmm. he had a bumper sticker on his truck. It said, train hard, 
test easy. Yeah, that's that's the that's the mentality, and it works. It so. does absolutely, it may, and that's beyond the practical reasons to do that. For example, out here, we want a dog that's steady to wing shot and fall, so that he doesn't chase a chucker off a cliff. Sure. Yep. Or you know, a rattlesnake or whatever. Exactly. So, yep. There are, and that's why don't you, in in a nutshell, describe. Let's let's stick to this utility test. Mm -hmm. After utility test, and I I I wear out the mantra that you, you know if your dog can can pass a, a utility test, you're going to have the best dog in the field, bar none. But yeah, that, I, and and it is a test for hunting dogs. So as a judge outline it for us yeah i think that actually i think the utility test is harder than the invitational to be honest <laughs> with you. um there there's i mean even though you don't have you know the, the brace work you know other than that but yeah i think there's there's more more elements to the utility test i think um than than there is and and you know there's a lot more options for something to really go wrong there you, you know. go <laughs> But, uh, you know, for, for the utility test, obviously the field work, you know, um, we're looking for the dog to be steady wing shot and follow minimal commands in the field, a lot of cooperation there, hunting for the handler, um, making good retrieves back to hand, uh, minimal commands there. And then, you know, the duck search is where most dogs fall up short, at least in the statistics. But, you know, being able to switch gears from, okay, I, I can't chase a bird in the field, but now I got to chase a duck on the water. A lot of dogs have, you know, that's a, that's a shifting gears issue and dogs need to learn, um, you know, what the task is and some dogs do and some dogs don't. So, um, you know, going out there and independently searching that body of water and looking for that duck for 12 to 14 minutes, um, isn't, isn't an easy task. And it's a big jump from, from natural ability up to that level so it's which is why we have that upt test in there yeah, but, uh, yeah. you know and the, and the drag you know represents uh really the drag is all about obedience and what's that dog going to do at the end of the day after a long hard day of training <laughs> what's it going to do out of sight of the handler when it encounters game is it going to bury it is it going to pick it up and drop it is it going to mouth it is it going to bring it right back so you forgot it's the most a, important one. Is I call it going to swallow it? <laughs> it's the test. It's the test of integrity, in my opinion. <laughs> I love that. So true. Uh, the, you know, I invented the real bird bumper because I watched one of my dogs take a sniff on that dead duck, try to pick yeah. it up, couldn't get his mouth around it. He'd never picked up anything that big and heavy before. I thought, yeah. oh my god. So um, yeah, it is tough. And and then usually Phil Swain is laying about twelve uh, feet up, <laughs> watching of, everything, yeah. watching everything that's happening, making very detailed notes about what the dog is doing, and then, yeah. then obviously then you know the the water retrieves, um, you know the single water retrieve with with all that diversion shooting going on, the studying this by blind and, and the remaining by blind sequence, you know that's a lot of stress and strain on a dog, so. You know, those are all things that uh, that a dog has to be mentally tough to to really take that kind of training and be able to to really flow through that test and not have any hiccups. Yeah, it's a tough one, and and we'll talk uh, uh, in a few minutes about how you judge those tests as well. But let's let's get on to some of the more important stuff. Uh, what are you working on with your dogs right now in terms of training? Right now, um, doing a lot of conditioning because we're obviously coming yeah. up on hunting season. So we're really getting them in condition shape so that uh, when early October rolls around, they're they're ready to go. Um, and I'm also you know laying the groundwork now. I've got doing some some uh, land blind retrieves and some yeah. handling drills uh, with my dog that qualified for the invitational. Um, just getting him handling to hand signals, um, working out. I like to train the blind retrieve before I do a lot of the double mark because you can handle on that double mark uh, yeah. if, you, if you need to. So I like to put that into place before I really start doing that in earnest. And and just, you know, my dog's back, really, they're strong backers. So I, I ran some AKC uh, Master Hunter tests um, this spring just to see some different dogs in different situations, and he did really well through those. So it's a good just a good practice in, in their front events too to get into so i believe it you know um let's go back to um to some of that because um it's so and at your house it's the same way it's hot it's muggy yeah how how do you get enough miles on your dog yeah it's tough i mean it's 
it, they acclimate to the to the to the heat and humidity, but still they're it's it's hard on you. Got to watch. I mean, keep them you know early morning, late evening, you know, last yeah. couple hours of, of yeah. dark when it starts to cool off. Or I like to actually run them in the rain. I, oh, I yeah. do a lot of training in the rain. Yeah. Um. So that's always good for them. They kind of like it and it keeps them cool. So. Yeah, we had we had a gully washer a few days ago, and and all my dog could think about was. I'm offended by all this stuff falling out of the sky. I mean, <laughs> he didn't quite know what to do about it, but uh, but we had a great this morning. It was under 50 degrees when we when oh, we nice. went out. He, have you seen this? They're mileage. You know, if you're free running them, mm-hmm. I don't care how many miles you walk, the dog will run twice as many miles oh, when it's easily. under 50 degrees. Yeah, yeah, easily. Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I I've been around some field trailers for quite a few years, and I've run some field trials. And there's an old guy that told me that if you can cool down a dog's body, you know, a degree or two, you're going to get about 20 more minutes of good run out of them. Wow. And so I've taken that to heart. I've I've kind of, in my own mind, proved it to myself. And, yeah. and a lot of times, if it's hot and I'm, you know, getting ready to run a dog in a trial or a test, I I put a cold blanket on them and. It's been dipped in ice. Try to cool their body down a little bit to the, where they're shaking a little bit, and then it usually helps out with another fifteen to twenty minutes of good run in them before they get wow, you know, get tired. So you 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 say a cool blanket instead of dipping them in the horse trough. I bet. Yeah, I don't like to get them soaking wet, so I'll yeah. take a blanket like a. What I actually use is like a, a an auto chamois, like you used yeah, to drive yeah, your car yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll put it in the bottom of my ice cooler, ice chest in the morning, and as the ice melts, it kind of gets wet and cold. And I just wring it out and I wrap it around their chest and their midsection. I might have a couple of those, yeah. just uh, just to cool them down. And uh, you know, their hair is a little bit wet. Don't want them soaked. Just yeah. just a little bit damp. And then uh, it, it's worked pretty well for me over the years. Oh, I'm gonna do that. I'm stealing that idea starting <laughs> tomorrow. And, and you know. The soaking down the dog completely like that, uh, two things that I learned, one from an old trainer way back in the desert, was if you're going to put your dog in cool water and cool them off, number one, don't make it really cold. Number two, you got to keep them in there till they stop panting. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and the problem with putting them in there preemptively is, uh, Larry Mueller told me this years ago, he said, that lays all their hair down flat mm-hmm. and traps all the body heat under the hair. Yep. Yeah. It does. Yep. I never thought about that until he clued me in. So, uh, good on you, and thanks for that tip. I got my sham wows in the truck most there of the time. Go. So there, there you go. There you go. Um, help me with backing. That's another mm-hmm. one that every everybody likes to do. Uh, they love to see it, but they hate to train it. What you know? It's <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the easiest thing to do. I mean. Um, the reason it's it, that people hate to train it is because most people, or a lot of people, and I've I've done this a couple of seminars I've done lately. I've asked the question, when do you guys start training? You know, when you're backing and really concentrate on it. I say, well, after we pass the utility test. <laughs> well, that's not when you start training backing. You start that when that puppy's, you know, a little fella just starting to, to point birds in the field. Once he's got his pointing instinct, you know, backing is just a an extension of pointing instinct. So if you have a dog that has good pointing instinct. Um, it has an ounce of cooperation in his body. He'll he'll back. So, um, yeah, I train it early. And another thing that a lot of people do is I let my dog retrieve off of the back, too. If he gets yeah. a good back, yeah. um, that gives them reward. I don't do it every time, you know, because they'll yeah. start to expect it. But now and again, I will definitely give them a retrieve off the back. So, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've uh, always done it early in life and just made a very positive thing and really you know i run some beepers on my dogs here in pennsylvania early when it's leaf covered Mm -hmm. and they really seem to learn that when that beeper's going off that's another clue above and beyond just the visual of the dog but they hear that beeper and that helps them to back also i've had dogs my most of my dogs back the sound of the beeper without even seeing the other dog so i love it well, that that is that is useful information, that's for sure. And uh, I, I someday we'll get to that. But I'm I missed the boat on the young dog part of it. But uh, we'll see what we can do there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's Curtis Fry. He's a NAVDA judge. He runs English Setters. Hey, hey Curtis, are yours? Uh, I mean, do we just call them English Setters, or do they have that funny name with two L's at the beginning? No, I mean. Th- 
it's rare to find pure Llewellyns nowadays. Yeah. There are probably some out there. I mean, there's probably some bloodline in, in them somewhere along the line, but uh, no, mine are the Americanized English setter with the high 12 o'clock tail. So would that be a Ryman line or would that be uh, something else? I, You know, the Ryman, if I recall, are those, you could put a saddle on some of those dogs. Yeah, they were big. Mine aren't big. Mine are yeah. more... Um, some of the hemlock, there's some hemlock yeah, in there. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, most of my dogs, I'll give a shout out. And most the the breeds that I, the, the the bloodlines I look for in my dogs are out of actually out in your neck of the woods, Tacoma Mountain, out in the yeah. Oregon there. So yeah. I, I have a couple of dogs I flew in from from the box, and really they have some outstanding bloodlines and some outstanding dogs, and that's where where my dogs have come from and what I bred my dogs too in order to get some of the dogs i have now so excellent well you can go scratch your dogs under their chin or behind their ears for a moment we're going to take a moment to make a couple commercial announcements curtis fry will be back with all the insights you get when you're testing or training for a NAVDA test and all the other things that are involved in hunting a great dog, we'll also hit the um, social media pages and talk about what conservation group is doing an excellent job. Curtis, hang on for a moment. Everybody else, don't go away. Because we are brought to you in part by sageandbreaker.com. Always free shipping. Sign up for the mailing list. You won't miss any of the sales. You'll also get the first word on new products. For example, when CLP, that great spray I use all the time, when it came out, I knew about it weeks before everybody else, and Fred was kind enough to send some to me. Everything from their bore cleaning kit to their firearms grease, all of those things are available to take care of your firearms this season. At the end of the day, at the end of the season, whenever you need to do something to your gun, sageandbreaker.com has got something for you to do it with. And then when you're going to your own NAVDA test or training day, your dog should be traveling in a rough land kennel. More dogs ride in a rough land kennel than any other performance kennel. I was just looking around at some of the other stuff out there, and I realized, yeah, there are a whole bunch of brilliant things that Doug has figured out in designing that rough land kennel. Number one, they pioneered the whole roto-molded dog crate world. Everybody else is an imitator, and some of them imitate it with more than one piece. So you got to assemble the dang thing. Or that two-assembly lip thing that you screw together means less room inside for your dog. Learn more about the other 15 or 20 good reasons to buy a Roughland kennel at roughlandkennels.com. And hopefully he's back and the dogs aren't going to be too noisy. I doubt they will be. He's probably got a secret command for it. Curtis Fry, welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you. It's great to be back. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I haven't screwed it up yet. <laughs> um, we, we're, we're talking a lot about NAVDA, and, and, and I apologize, everybody. But, you know, like I said, you, you train in the NAVDA system. You're basically training the things that need to be done in the field. Of all of those things, what do you think is the most important aspect? Is it cooperation or is it something else, Curtis? You know, I think it is cooperation, really. Well, there's two things. I think cooperation and desire. Obviously, uh-huh. those are, the, in my opinion, the, the two most important traits. And obviously the nose. But, you know, the cooperation is, is something that it's different than obedience. You know, cooperation is that unspoken bond, that unspoken command that you have with your dog, that he just knows what you want him to do and he does it. Um, that the, the, the obedience part can be taught. Um, cooperation, not so much. Um, you can make a dog more cooperative by teaching it obedience, but but the cooperation is that unspoken bond, which I think is important um, because really that that whole utility test and really at the invitation level, you're you're out there as a team. You know, you're a team with your dog, and and you can screw your dog up just as easily as he can screw himself up. So that unspoken bond is an important one. Obviously, the drive that's something you can't put in there. The dog is born with it or born without it and it has to have it in order to be effective so i think those are the the, the most important traits in my opinion so you're out there and, and 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 you guys practice this and and number one thank you for being a volunteer navda judge 
Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> people, uh, people may not know that uh, at any given test, and there are, am I safe to say hundreds of hunt tests in a year? Hundreds oh, of yeah, days easily. of hunt tests. Yes, yes. You've got to have at least one out-of-town judge. And so these guys, are they're getting on a plane on Thursday night. They're flying all night. They're getting up on Friday morning and walking, well, six to 12 dogs through a hunt all day. It's, you ever done check the mileage on one of those? You know, at the Invitational, I think one of the first Invitations I ever judged was out in um, Missouri, New, Me- New Mexico, Missouri. And that was when Garmin had just come out with like their wrist worn. Oh GPS, yeah. You know? yeah. And so they had, you know, Garmin and Tritronics being kind of tied together. They had given us some units to, to wear. And I was in the field on the first day. And I think we walked two and a half to three miles per brace. Wow. And typically you got five or six braces yep. in your field. So it adds up pretty quick. Well, especially in uh, September in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you could be humid in Pennsylvania, but yeah. but in Missouri, the temperature and the humidity are probably the same that time of year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So go, let's go back to cooperation. If, if you're a judge mm-hmm. and, and you're looking at a dog uh, in the field, mm-hmm. uh, what are the key tells that indicate that dog is actually cooperative? So one would be that he's hunting for the handler. I mean, that's probably the biggest one, right? Is on that search. Is he hunting for the handler? Is he hunting for himself? You know, when we are out in that field and we tell the handler, hey, turn this direction, it's not just at a whim. We, we want to see if that dog has enough cooperation to look at them and say, oh, they're going a different direction. I need to get out in front there and hunt this yeah. direction without you know, necessarily being hacked on and called to do it every time. Yeah, yeah. So that's one big thing. The other thing is um, on the retweet, retrieve sequence, you know, it, it's been kind of explained to some of the Ames clinics that um, obedience takes the dog out to the retrieve and cooperation brings them back. And so that cooperation, <laughs> <I love> that. <laughs> that cooperation is what happens kind of away from the handler and that obedience is what happens in close proximity to the handler. So when we see a dog pick up a bird and immediately turn and come right back to the handler, that's good cooperation. And even pointing, I mean, that, you know, the dog that stands there and points and holds his point steady while that handler walks up to him, um, that pointing sequence is a lot of cooperation. So it's an unspoken bond that that dog's going to stand there and let the handler come up and, and flush the bird. So those are all things that we look for in, in cooperation. You know, some of that, I think you can, uh, you can encourage it. You said you couldn't teach cooperation. I, I, I think right. I agree. But there, are, if you see it happening, you can sure help encourage more of that can't you sure yep you sure can you know i was just at lunch today i put a couple pigeons out in launchers for my wire hair and uh you know we we're we're back on a refresher course in some aspects of it so i was really positive when he hit that point and when he held that point and when the bird went down i was positive at every juncture there and whether you call it obedience or you call it cooperation i don't think it's a downside to help on a dog understand when he's doing what you want him to do oh absolutely i mean positive reinforcement is definitely the the best way to train obviously a dog that knows what he's doing when he does something wrong you know you have to let him know hey you did that wrong yeah um but when he does something right you also have to say hey you did that right good job you know so yeah. Yeah. it's important that to be positive when they're doing it right as well you know i mentioned larry mueller earlier uh and people uh please look up larry's book what's he call it speed train your own bird dog i think is the book that i did it's still on my bedside table um and you know it's it's old school stuff but there's some incredible uh insights there as well and and he talks about opening a dog's nose or awakening mm-hmm. a dog's nose very early in their puppyhood um yep. which involves food you know, it's about mm-hmm. food treats, you know, mm-hmm. hiding them and, you know, getting the dog to search. Do you, what, do you use food treats for any aspect of your training? You know, I use food treats primarily for gun sensitivity, training, uh-huh. believe it or not, noise uh-huh. sensitivity. I wouldn't say gun, I would just say noise. Yeah. Um, I try to get that feed time consistent with my puppies, you know, especially young dogs a couple times a day. And they kind of know when that, they start to learn that, Hey, it's, it's nine o'clock. It's time for breakfast. They're going to start, you know, Hey, I'm hungry. And so 
I'll start the feeding process while I'm banging bowls and making a lot of noise, banging yeah. while they eat. And they're just associating, you know, that noise and that banging with something positive. So it makes the whole noise sensitivity thing much easier Yeah. You know, when you first go to shoot on a, you know, with a bird out there. So well, I let, definitely use, use food for that aspect. Let's take it to the next step. I mentioned earlier in the podcast before you came on that, uh, you know, a lot of people these right, right about now are calling or sending me emails about uh, introduction to gunfire. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm no expert, but I, I knock wood, I haven't had a failure in my own dogs. We've rescued a few gun-shy dogs, but um, I do I do it my way, but I don't want to hear about my way. I already know it. What, what, what is your basic approach to actually introducing guns? Yeah, so that's a good question. A lot of people just kind of skip this step, and it's an important one because it can really have a, a bad effect on the dog for its entire life. Contrary to popular belief, dogs are not born gun shy. Yeah, um, there are some breeds that may be more sensitive than others that may have a propensity of becoming gun shy, but they're not born gun shy. They're made gun shy by mistakes um, by their owner. And so, what I do, along with you know that little puppy in the food banging the bowls and taking a spoon and smacking the middle bowl while he's feeding and getting used to the noise, is you know when a dog is is now enough to be on some birds and be out there, and I really try to take the drive and that's why i said drive is so yeah, important. desire yeah. that, that that desire build that prey that that paid drive and that prey desire to where that dog is going to chase a bird on the wing yeah and what i do is i usually have one of my boys with a blank gun 30 yards behind me and i have a satchel full of pigeons and we're out in the field bouncing around and that puppy's having a good time and i'll fling a bird that he can see and he'll start chasing and as he's chasing, I have one shot. Yeah. And I see what the reaction is. And it's at a distance, and like I said, it's just a blank shot. And if I see no reaction, then we move in a little closer, and we just work up until we're able to toss a bird and shoot, you know, right next to that puppy with a couple of bangs with a blank gun, and we move up to actually shooting a bird over the dog pointing. Mm -hmm. So. You know, so here is the crux of the issue. Um, the nexus is always, and it's the same in so many other aspects of training. All right, I get that, and I'm I'm with you, hundred percent, Curtis Fry. Uh, this is all about getting the dog excited and chasing birds. And at some point, mm -hmm. though, we got to stop them from chasing birds. Mm -hmm. So yep. what do you do next? Where where what's that magic step in between? Once the dog shows me that he, like I've, I've had dogs that come out that have never seen a bird. Mm -hmm. They're almost like almost afraid of birds. They yeah. don't know what they are. So yeah. that dog needs a little more encouragement. Maybe it needs to even kill a bird. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's, usually that's the cardinal rule. You don't want your dog catching a bird, right? Yeah. Because it breaks down your pointing. But some, some dogs need that prey drive to come alive. Yeah. It's like opening up the nose. It's like you got to bring it. You got to kind of bring it out. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. And you got to bring it out. Once you know, once I've shot over my dogs, and I know they're they're good with the gun sensitivity, and we're past that. And I have a dog that's bold enough that I feel he doesn't need to chase birds because his prey drive is there. Yeah. He yeah. doesn't chase birds anymore. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And, and really, it, it comes down to getting him to hold point. And me being able to get there if I don't have him steady at that point to be able to hold him while the bird's flushed. And, you know, you can obviously do that, you know, getting the dog to hold point with the best way is with wild birds. Yeah. And if one pops and he chases, there's not much you can do there because you just can't get there. But they eventually learn that, hey, I can't catch the bird. I'm just going to stand here and point it. Yeah. Um, you can also do that with pigeons and traps. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. You know, that's how most of us do it because we don't have an abundance of wild birds to train with every day. So, um, you know, but really once the dog shows me that, Hey, I, I know why I'm out here. I'm out here with a purpose. I'm going to point these birds and that's the point where, okay, you're done chasing. Yeah. You know, in fact, uh, if I recall, uh, way, way, way back in the day, I think, uh, one of our esteemed founders of NAVDA was big on that. Bodo Winterhelt was talking about the same thing. Once they got bird drive, mm -hmm. don't let them catch anything. Exactly. Yep. Yeah so true let's let's go into the field uh you're hunting with me and um and 
what is, or anybody else, but usually me, because I'm the best bad example out there on television. <laughs> what is the most likely biggest mistake I make when it comes to handling a dog in the field when we're hunting? Talking too much to them. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you have seen my show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you like, I don't even whistle my dogs back when I'm grouse hunting. I, I've taught them to come back on a collar tone. Yeah, that, yeah. Because, you know, while, and I love to hunt wild birds. And so, you know, it, wild birds, believe it or not, hear people talking uh -huh. and uh -huh. move. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I almost hunt birds like I hunt would hunt a deer. Yeah. I'm, I'm out there, you know, my dog is moving, but I'm not, I don't do a whole lot of talking to them. That's yeah. why cooperation is so important to me because the dog has to know where I'm at and he has to check me and has to, and I can't be whistling him around and calling him and, you know, every two seconds worrying about, is he too far away or too close to me or is he behind me? You know, I, I need to have that cooperation in place so that yeah. he's out there doing what he needs to do. So that that's the biggest thing I think is people just, they get nervous, you know, especially with first bird dog, mm -hmm. you know, the dog is supposed to be out there running independent and they get nervous and they start calling him back, Yeah, you know. You know, it's funny. Uh, of course, it's too late by then. All of that ought to have been dealt with in the yard and in a training <laughs> situation first, so that when you do go out, you have the confidence that the dog is, first off, making good decisions, including yeah. the decision to cooperate and, and come to yes. the front or whatever else you're you're wanting him to do. But I, I wrote a piece for somebody, I don't know, three, four months ago on stealth. And mm -hmm. uh, only because I learned the hard way so many times. You know, if you're talking about yesterday's football game or or you got all this crap. You know, I, I cited a an ad for something in one of the Gundog magazines, and it had a guy in a, uh, you know, a, a hunting vest, and there was crap hanging from his neck, from his hat, <laughs> every possible place on his. He probably had a pot and a pan and a and one of those old <laughs> wool covered canteens hanging off the back. All that stuff is making noise the whole time, and that's before sure. he's he's calling somebody on his cell phone. Yeah, yeah. I I I just thought that was a perfect example of the opposite of stealth. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm glad to hear that somebody who knows what they're doing feels that way as well. So th <laughs> thank you. Um, you, you. When you're at a, you go to training days. We all go to training days. We all go to the tests. So, you know, what what is the what is the biggest um, the biggest training challenge we all have that. I know none of them are finger snap kind of solutions, but there there are some things we're just we're not seeing it right. Our perspective is wrong, and if we only were to stand over here instead, we'd get mm -hmm. it. Do mm -hmm. you see those? Yeah, there's there's some things I think that the people. I think it's it's maybe even just maybe a fact that they don't know. Yeah. Um, I think. There's so many people I hear say my dog is a natural retriever, uh -huh. and and they they may be, but they're not. There's no real such thing as a pure natural retriever. That some dogs, just like I said, that dogs aren't don't come out of the womb, you know, gun shy. They're made that way. Yeah. Dogs will retrieve. They have a propensity to retrieve or want to pick up birds and and carry them around. But the the level of retrieve that we require and the level of retrieve, I think that that is appropriate for a conservation tool, which is our dog needs to be trained. And that's, that's done you know, with the condition retrieve. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people that I've, I've condition retrieved hundreds of dogs because people are afraid to do it or don't know how to do it or yeah. just shy away from it. Um, and it, it's not that it's negative. It's just, they're afraid of screwing up something, you know, and I don't blame them. I mean, we've all been there. We all learned the hard sure. way, I think, on that. And and you're right. But, you know, the opposite is also true. You know, you start talking about this with folks who've had more than a few dogs, and they'll tell you that some people call it force breaking, and that maybe scares them off right there. But mm -hmm. force breaking a dog, you talk to a guy who's been through a few dogs, and he'll tell you it's the best bonding experience Absolutely. they've ever had. Yeah, that's, that's, if you have a dog that's, that, you know, about that, you know, for my dogs, they mature a little later in life, but they, they're getting around that, you know, 12 to 14 month age or teenagers and they're full of themselves and they're a little bit unruly. That's the best time. I love to put them on the table and start doing the condition retreat because it, the obedience goes through the roof. You have their complete attention. 
Um, and that's where you can influence their cooperation now because you're really starting to to bond with them. Your hands yeah. are on them. It's a hands-on training. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a really good way to, to definitely do that. You know, and, and you know, if, if you read enough about that stuff, if, whether it's the old school books or anything else, you know, there are, there are strings and pliers and all sorts of other medieval torture devices yeah. used on all yeah. of this. W- what do you, what's your general approach to uh, what you call the condition to retrieve? Yep. So I actually was taught, um, by a good friend of mine who was a big retriever trainer, um, how to, to condition retrieve dogs. And so, um, I, I've done it that way in most of my career with, you know, different, different changes for, for here and there for, for different dogs and different mentalities. But I start with what's called the ear roll. It's yeah. basically an ear pinch in the ear canal, mm-hmm. um, using my thumbnail and it's really just a irritation. It's not really pain. It's just an irritation. And then, once I have the dog, you know, popping a dowel out of my hand with that ear roll, I transition as fast as I can over to the e collar. Yeah. And everything after that is done with the e collar. And and where is it? Oh, is it on his neck then? Yeah, I okay. do it on the neck. I have had some very hard headed labs that I've worked with or I've had collars on the neck and the belly. Yeah. Um but Primarily, I would say 99% of the dogs I've forced, fetched, or conditioned, or treated yeah. more politically correct is, uh, uh, um, has been on the, you know, the key collar on the neck. All right. So, so just, just for the record, mm-hmm. you got a dog, uh, you got a dowel in one hand, you got the dog in your other hand, if you will. Mm-hmm. You're going to apply pressure, however mm-hmm. you define that, with whatever device you're using at the moment. What uh, what what do you want? What do you do next, and what's your expectation? So the the take a step back. The very first thing I teach a dog is to hold. Yeah, it's a okay. hold command. It's, right. it's not it's not the fetch. It's hold. Yeah, yeah. So I'm taking that dowel, and and really I got a dowel in my hand, a dowel in my back pocket. I got the dog's collar. He's up on a table. He's usually attached to a wire, so yeah. he can't jump yeah. off and run down the table. And I'm pulling back his jowls, putting the 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 dial in behind his canines, closing his mouth and telling him to hold. Yeah. And a lot of praise under the chin. So the head comes up like he's presenting that dial to you. And that helps him to hold that lower mandible shut. Yeah. On the dial. Yeah. Um, yeah. So once they're holding that, and the reason I have the one in my back pocket is because if they drop it, I immediately <laughs> want to, I immediately want to apply pressure pull the dial out of my back pocket and put it into his mouth again so he knows that's not what's supposed to happen. Okay, let me make a note here. Buy two dozen dowels and, <laughs> and bigger pockets. Bigger pockets, yeah. yeah. Okay, so and, so you're, when I was a musician mm-hmm. um, and we had to memorize tunes, and sometimes we had to, I'd, I'd memorize the last part of the tune first. You're, in a lot of ways, that's what you're doing here. You're starting with what amounts to almost the finished product holding that thing in his mouth. Right. And then everything's downhill from there. It kind of is because really, if you think about it though, that if he's picking it up, he's got to hold it. Right. So yeah, it's, it's easier to get that dog comfortable with, with something in his mouth. If he's just holding it there versus reaching out and picking it up. Exactly. Um, So, you know, the next step is you, you now apply pressure you start with the fetch word and you have that dowel right against his lips and you apply pressure. And when he, you try to force it, open his mouth, stick it in there again, hold the jowls back and close the mouth and then command hold. Yeah. So it's fetch and hold. And you're applying that pressure either with the ear roll or with the e collar until that mouth comes open. He's got it in his mouth and he's holding it. And then the pressure goes away. Okay. Stop. And, Just let me, because this is, this is eye opening to me because I just okay. I just had a flash. Check me on this, and hopefully it helps other people as well. We're not simply trying to make that dog yelp in pain. No, no, We're, no. It's he, con- know, it's he knows he knows what he's supposed to do. That thing's supposed to go in his mouth, and he's supposed mm-hmm. to hold it. So, right. so at some point, he's you know you're saying you know as soon as you do that, there's no pressure anymore. Correct. And that, and it's, 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 that's why we call it, at least I try to call yeah. it the condition retrieve versus yeah. force fetch because force fetch has a negative connotation to a lot of people. So it's, and if you think about it, you know, Pavlov, when he rang the bell, then fed the dog, that was a condition response, right? Yeah. 
And that's what we're doing here. We're conditioning the dog that when he feels that pressure, the conditioned response is put that down in your mouth. Yeah. And it turn, and it goes away. But he knows already. It's just like any other aspect of e-collar training. You don't yeah. use an e-collar yeah. until he knows what he's supposed exactly. to do. The, the three-step action plan of, of teaching the dog what the collar is before you don't yeah. just strap the collar on and start commanding while there's a three-step action plan you go through. You know, to introduce the e-collar to the dog, so the dog understands how to turn it off and what he's supposed to do. Yeah. Um, with that, with that stimulation. I can't so, leave yes. it at that. Uh, tell me more about the three-step action plan, Curtis <laughs> Fry. By the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Navda Judge Setter Man, Bird Dog uh, fanatic, fanatic, and and a bird hunter too. What a coincidence! Curtis Fry is his name, and he's here to enlighten us uh, with the three-step action plan. So, yeah, the three-step action plan is basically teaching the dog um, three different actions, which are basically the foundation for every other command you're going to teach the dog. And teaching it first, you know, the dog has to have kind of an understanding. So that little puppy, you kind of teach him, whoa, you know, just with a with a six-foot collar, and you teach him to come to you a little bit. You call him and you reel him in with the, with the leash, and, and you teach him to, to change direction in the field like this way or come this way or come over here and that kind of thing. So he's kind of got an idea of what some of that means. But when you start the three-step action plan with the e-collar, you know, the first step is determining what level the dog feels on the stimulation. Yeah. So you put your e-collar on. When, once you see that ear go back and he looks like, what was that? You know, okay, the dog can feel that stimulation because not all dogs, you know, work at that low one or the low two some of them are on a three you know it just mm. depends on that color i'm looking at what... a six right here <laughs> i've seen some of those so so what we do with a three-step action plan is we start teaching i i teach woe first yeah it's probably our most important command and i yeah. have the dog on a leash and what i do is i start the first step is to start the e-collar command woe guide the dog with the leash to get the stop and then let off the stimulation so whether or not he's got it figured out yet that's you're the, putting yeah, two and two together for him exactly yeah. so you're teaching that dog basically to woe to the stimulation and what you'll start to see is when you start that stimulation the dog is going to stop on his own without you even saying anything yeah yeah and that now he's been conditioned retrieve and it can happen the first session it could happen two days later but it'll come to the point where that dog's like, oh, I just stopped. That goes away. It's the yeah. same thing as we're doing with the retreat. So once I have him, you know, pretty far advanced where I'm introducing, you know, the, the, three, the three rules of training are, you know, location, duration, distraction. So once I've taken him to different locations and done this and I've had different distractions and I've had him stand there for a couple of minutes on a well and he's handling all that, then I start teaching the second action which has come to me. Yeah. And I use the same method. It's a step-by-step -step basis. And the third, the third action is changing direction. You know, let's, if I'm in the field and I turn and he may not see me, I just say, Oh, this way, you know, and here it comes around in front of yeah. me. Yeah. And so you're teaching the dog those three actions. And after the dog learns those three actions on the e-collar, you can teach them to do pretty much anything. Um, you can do force to the back pile for your retrieving um, because really that's just a change in direction going yeah. away from you. Yeah. Um, you can teach healing. Healing is just a form of a woe command, but it's, it's a, con it's a controlled woe with the dog still moving, but he's in close proximity. Um, so there's those three actions are the basis for everything else you're going to teach your dog. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a variation on the theme that we've heard before. You want a dog to go away come back and hold still yep that's it um if only it was that simple with a dog <laughs> <laughs> maybe they need to read the book too uh, maybe. we could talk all day but i do want to ask you just a couple more questions and let, and, and promise me you'll come back again will you will absolutely you, great absolutely. Uh, this is wonderful yeah. and i'm learning so much um first off <clears throat> when you're in the field whether it's dog gear or anything else what is one piece of gear that you bring that we 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 probably hadn't thought about I'll share you. I'll share you mine when you share me yours. A pair of needle nose pliers. Yeah. And how do you? Or, use or a Leatherman. Or okay. A Leatherman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, is it for what I think it is? Pulling quills or, or something? Yeah, that's that's yeah. one reason for yeah. sure. Yeah, and yeah. also, um, if it has a, a good set of wire cutters on yeah. it because of uh, conibear traps as well. 
Do you think you could cut a cotter bear with those things? If my if my dog was in it, yes, I, I'd I get it. it. Yeah, I could. Yeah. I would probably have enough adrenaline in me to cut it loose. Well, interestingly, mine is related, and you know Terry Wilson at Ugly Dog mm-hmm. Hunting. Yep. yep. I asked Terry the same question. He said, um, uh, "A so and so cable cutter." I said, mm-hmm. "What?" For, you know, for, for, snares, for snares, for new yeah. snares, because yeah. I, yeah. I always had a pair of side cutters. He yep. said, no, they won't do it. Yeah. So I bought a pair of cable cutters. And, and then I looked at them. I thought, you know, I could probably get those around a con of bear trap. Yeah. And I might. I don't want to test it because I might break them, but, <laughs> but it's better than nothing. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, good to know. And what's a couple more ounces in a vest? Exactly. Yep. Are you feeding before a hunt? Do you feed your dogs? No, I I typically don't. I, I try to feed. That that's this is where I pick my battles because my wife likes to feed yeah. free feed and I like to feed once a day. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're on a trip, it's kind of hard. I usually feed at the end of the day. Yeah. When they're you know getting put up for the evening, just before that, let them let them out to a short exercise, have them eat, air them out, and then put them to bed. But yeah. uh, I don't don't like to run my dogs with uh with a full with a full stomach just yeah. bloat problems and yeah. really just you know bloody stools it, it does cause gastrointestinal issues so i try to yeah. try to run them as empty as i can and you know we, we had carl gunzer on from purina a week or two ago and he you know he they have the the research on uh, how it robs energy yeah you know what you know if you were going to run a marathon <clears throat> you probably wouldn't want to eat a pizza that morning no, and I'll tell you the other thing too. In hot weather, it, it, oh yeah, you know, digestion causes heat. Yeah, that's what he said. And so yeah, it causes it causes the dog's temperature to rise. So and it also it also robs water from from your muscles. Yes, yes. yeah. And then you get lactic acid build up and you get pain. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole vicious circle. All right. So one more thing, and then I promise I'll turn you loose, and we'll do this again sometime. Sure. You you, talk, you used a few words that I I think I use most of the same words, but. You know, someday I'll. Hey, maybe that'll be a good Facebook question. Um, what are what are the command words you use that maybe are better than the ones we use? Okay, so when I want my dog to release, so to speak, from a command, uh-huh. um, I use "take a break," okay. and that's just because a lot of people say "okay," but "okay" is used so much in just normal conversation. Yeah, that you know. I use a word that's not typically used in normal. So, I, so when, when my yeah. dog's on a woe and we've shot the bird or we've done this and, you know, let's, let's say, you know, uh, it's time for the dog to, to release and, and go do his thing. I'll stay, take a break. I know, love to it. Get, to get him out of there. So that's, that's yeah. one, one thing I use pretty much the rest are pretty standard. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. I use all right for the same reason, a, a, mm-hmm. a, a behaviorist, a, a wolf trainer years ago, reminded me of that the other one i do is i i just don't want to use words that uh that sound the same yeah you know so yeah. uh let's see where's the good one oh i you know heal and hear yeah correct yep so we don't heal we walk yep yep good i know a guy that well actually bob croner you might know bob croner he's called mr nob the great yeah. great guy in our yeah. shenango chapter yep he trains his dogs using various uh um varieties of of soda so he had pepsi <laughs> he had coke he had sprite <laughs> i love it well that's better than german but they're both bad. you leave your dog at the boarding kennel for a couple of days and they don't and the dog looks at everybody like they're weird <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> uh, oh but I, uh, that's fantastic oh good for him well curtis fry uh this has been fun it was fun watching your setter uh at the navda invitational and and just sharing a little bit of the uh, got to be an incredible amount of satisfaction with a dog that that passes that test and if Absolutely. everybody else wants to watch that dog and watch everybody else who did such a great job there it's on the youtube channel so go to i think i i think my youtube channel is scott linden outdoors so go there and and google it up from there and you'll you'll find it but it it, it was so fun to watch so fun to make that show maybe we'll do it again some other year but in the meanwhile curtis uh, maybe i'll see you at a at an event or two i'm gunning from believe it or not people ask me to gun at their navda tests um, all right so uh, maybe i'll see you there or maybe in the field curtis fry thanks for being such a integral part of the upland nation and the upland nation podcast 
Well, I appreciate you having me on. We have a lot more to come here on the Upland Nation podcast, including our Your Two Cents feature from our social media pages. You'll be interested. If you haven't voiced your opinion yet, go to one of the Facebook or the Instagram pages and talk about what conservation group is doing an excellent job. You might want to join it. And who's, uh, whose work needs a little improvement? We might even touch on some of those. It's all coming up in just a moment first. We are brought to you in part by LegacySports.com slash Pointer. Pointer shotguns are definitely a work of art at a price. That's a thing of beauty, and that is really important when you're kind of climbing the ladder of shotguns uh, in your career. If you're looking to upgrade, whether it's from a pump to a semi-auto or a semi-auto to an over and under, or maybe you're looking for a smaller gauge gun for some of the fun species you can chase with with those, they've got something for everybody there. They've got uh, all the gauges, all the levels of quality, and all styles from semi-automatic to over and under. All choices of various sorts when it comes to finishes, different colors in the Cerakote finish. They've got some synthetic stocks. They've got some high-grade walnut stocks for some of the upper-level guns. It's all available at LegacySports.com slash pointer. And take one of your new pointer guns to the camo event we've been talking about. My friends at Pheasant Bonanza are holding their first Burt County Bird Bounty, which benefits canine adoption and mentoring outdoors that's camo and a few other worthy causes the event takes place in early november but you got to sign up by october 1st learn more at k-a-m-o-i-n-c dot org slash bird dash bounty go to camo inc dot org and learn more about the entire weekend of events which includes upland and waterfowl hunting, sporting clays, social events, lodging, the whole Megillah, all benefiting Camo and a few other great groups. Thank you in advance for taking a look. And as promised, uh, you know, last week we had Howard Vincent, the CEO of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever on on the show, and I sure enjoyed uh, talking to him. Got to know him a lot better, even though I see him at least twice a year somewhere. Uh, In my opinion, which is the question I asked, or in your opinion, that conservation group is doing an excellent job. I'm glad I learned more about how they're doing it, and maybe you did as well. But I asked that question a few weeks ago on Facebook and uh, Instagram, and and intrigued by some of the answers you gave. Eric Copang said, I like the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. They're addressing big picture issues that affect each of the excellent single critter organizations. Isn't that the truth? And Eric, I remember the good old days when it was still the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Alliance, and I had a good buddy who helped in the very formative stages of that organization. Then I enjoyed my talk with Jim Range, one of the founders, when I was doing field and stream radio way back in the day. They're still going strong, and their their focus is all about helping guys like us find more access, uh, both for fishing and hunting. Travis Powers says his um, opinion is excellent. Most of the upland bird numbers are in decline. So he's not quite sure about that. I understand that. Travis, if you haven't yet, listen to Howard Vincent's uh, podcast interview from last week. And uh, I'm not saying he'll change your mind, but at least he'll give you some uh, perspective. Chris Ingram. Hey, Chris. Good to talk with you on Facebook instead of on the phone. Uh, He says they're all doing a great job. Anything is better than nothing. And I tell you, I I cannot agree more. Even though you send me money once in a while, it's absolutely true, Chris. So keep up the good work on Gundog Online as well. Sabrina Cerna says Quail Forever. Yeah, 
can't argue that. Around here, wherever she is, they maintain guzzlers, take out invasive plants. And the ones in Nevada are protecting quail water resources by fencing off the feral horse. I've seen some of that work up there. A lot of that is being done also by the Nevada Chucker Foundation. So everybody over there, stay cool when you're doing that work and be safe. Kevin McLaughlin says uh, none of them. They're spending way too much on nonsense and not enough on actual habitat work. Nick Bonnet says backcountry hunters and anglers. He says the rest of them are good old boy clubs. Yeah, yeah, we're all entitled to our opinion, that's for sure. And Nate Ayers says "Um, probably none, if I'm being honest. Far too many want to waste time talking and doing little with the resources given. Yes, again, that is, um, you know, you're, you know, there are places and times when that is absolutely true. Got to remember, most of these organizations are run by and all the work is done by volunteers. Kyle Broadfoot says backcountry hunters and anglers, again, actively fighting for access and public lands. He says, I do 90% of my hunting on public land, so that's a big deal for me. Can you agree? So can I. You're absolutely right. Thank you all for your comments, all worth considering. And on this podcast, we don't argue. We just respect everybody's opinion. Thanks for sharing it, folks. Let me remind you that we are brought to you in part by TrueLockChokes.com. That's T-R-U-L-O-C-K, chokes.com. These guys have done all the homework for you. You want to learn more about why good choke tubes are important? They've got information. You want to know which choke tubes you need for what species of bird? They've got it for you right there. It's a place you can learn something as well as buy stuff. And if you buy the right stuff, for example, any order of three or more choke tubes, you'll get a 10% discount. Orders over $119.99, you get free shipping. Get a free choke tube case when you order over 100 bucks worth of gear. It's all at truelockchokes.com. Take a look. See if you don't agree. They are a real valuable resource. And on that note, I want to thank Curtis Fry for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, All the things I learned from him, and maybe you did too. Thanks, Curtis, and good luck. Hope to see you in the field sometime soon. To all of you who comment at our social platforms, I appreciate all your thoughts. To those who leave a rating or, or a review wherever they get their podcast, hey, thank you so much. That's how we grow around here, and we're growing fast. The whole thing is made possible by the investments of Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Chokes. Hey, if you're looking for reasons to take a friend hunting this season, visit my site, FurFeathersFriends.com, and come on to Huron, South Dakota with us while you're there. Thank you again for listening. I'm Scott Linden. See you at the range or on the training field. 